Father, uh, we thank you always for being amongst us and in our midst. And Lord, sometimes we do that because we thank you for your comfort. We thank you because you are with us when we're down. You're with, us, you're with us when you're up. You speak to us through your word when we need you to. This morning, Lord, as your word, and we look at it together, Father, I pray not for comfort, because that most certainly isn't this morning's passage, but Lord, for change, for real transformation, for a sense of battle with our minds, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. That's going to set the tone, isn't it, really? Good morning, fellow Corinthians. Excellent. We're getting there. That's fantastic. I'm going to need to rush through quite a lot because we're going to be looking basically chapter 3, verses 5, right through to 417. Are you willing to join me on that? Fantastic. So, uh, well, we've learned lots of things. And uh, in the while well, we've been looking at the Corinthian letter, one, we're Corinthians, i.e., um, the situation the Corinth church were in, in the city of Corinth, is absolutely no different really from us, except we have cars, they have horse and cart, but they live in a multi-religious society, they are a highly tolerant society, uh, they allow all kinds of beliefs and things into their system, and basically they believe as a city they know better than God. Yep. That's, and then there's sexual morality, there is just about everything going on. It's really no different from Greenford. We've also learned that we are who? God's own possession. Well done. Yes, we're getting there slowly. Eventually, all of you, all in one hit, will recite it with me. Um, but I reckon that's going to take as long as it's taking me to get that far, which is probably by the end of the letter. We are sanctified. We are holy. Amen. Excellent. The letter was also written to try and find some unity within the church. Uh, there was factions going on, and that was based around they were following various human leaders. You know, follow Paul, follow Apollos, follow Peter. Oh, I only follow Jesus, you know, and quite frankly, they're the worst bunch out of all four of them because they have decided that the authority of the church leadership isn't worth taking on board. I only listen and speak to Jesus. There you go. We also spoke last time that Christ crucified is enough. And our fumbling speech with the convictional power of the Holy Spirit is enough. I.e., you don't have to be an eloquent talker or speaker. You can portray the gospel to anybody. Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit, his convictional power power in what Paul is referring to here is enough. It's your own story that tells the gospel. And also the wisdom of this world. Those who are maturing Christ Jesus have Christ's wisdom and therefore are spiritually mature. We know if you have true Christ's wisdom by the way our lives are lived. And if you want to see that, that will soon be on the website so I'm reliably informed. Is that not correct, Mr. Wilson, who is visiting here and Linda with us today? So we're going to look at, as I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, 4 to 17. I'm going to be absolutely upfront with you, my brothers and sisters. This is a message I do not want to be doing. I would rather somebody else was standing here and having to go through this teaching. I mean it wholeheartedly. Reason being, this entire next lot of passage is talking about Christian leadership and how the church should view the leaders of the church. So actually, a difficult teaching for me to discuss with you. I have spent probably longer than any other sermon I've ever done this week on this particular passage because I've had to unpack it, repack it. So I found it difficult. I will be upfront with you. 
uh, because this is not sort of the message, because I'm basically telling you how you should be viewing me, leadership team, ministry network, anybody that's in any form of leadership. So you can appreciate. So here, hopefully, God's spirit as I speak, my heart as I speak, and also, as we've always said, go away and study the scripture for yourself. If at any point I have misrepresented something in there, by accident, I hasten to add, I'm hoping that, please come and see me if you think I have misled the church in any way, shape or form. But please do that after you've gone away and studied it for yourself, not immediately after this sermon, please. So, we've had in chapter 1, verse 18 to 3, and, and chapter 3 to 4, Paul blames the Corinthian split, i.e. their faction, you know, they've broken up into little factions of who they're following, on their failure to reflect on the implications of the gospel of a crucified Messiah. But he says in chapter 3, verse 5, to chapter 4, verse 17, he adds that they have not truly grasped, therefore then, the nature of Christian leadership. They've not understood the nature of a crucified Messiah, which they haven't. They therefore then have not grasped the, uh, the concept of Christian leadership. So we finished last time with Paul berating the Corinthian church for showing allegiance to one church leader or another, depending on who their favorite was whether they liked their particular style or not, whether they thought they were eloquent enough. And he's actually saying, we found that, and then he was calling the church spiritually immature. So Paul, now in these following verses we're going to look at, wishes to underpin two truths about Christian leaders and who they are. So are you going to be with me on this, my brothers and sisters? Excellent. So let's listen to this together. Verses 5 to 9. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters works together for the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. And it says that you are God's building, but that's in the wrong section, believe it or not. When the verses got split up, that should have gone into verse 9, but we'll come to that in a moment. Sorry, verse 10. Thank you for pointing that out. So what's Paul saying? Leaders are servants. Amen? God's servants. Amen? Not the church's servants. They serve in the church because that is the work that the Lord gave them. He says that in verse 5, we are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. They do serve the church, but it's primarily the Lord they serve first. So we're serving the Lord by serving the church, okay? But it's the task that God has given leaders. And what's going on here within the Corinthian church? They keep putting all these leaders on pedestals. You know, oh, Paul is better than Cephas, saying one lot. One lot say, no, Cephas is better. And that, that goes on. And you might sit there and say, well, that doesn't happen here at Greenford. Probably doesn't. I hope it doesn't. I pray it doesn't. But it does happen in other churches, I'm afraid. There's this concept that actually sometimes the, the, the pastor is almost deified, venerated. And that shouldn't be happening. Because what's happened is they've attached themselves here in Corinth to one leader. Now, as he's saying, who are, who are Paul? Who is Apollos? We're only servants. We're only human, basically. And he's saying, by attaching yourself to one leader and saying this one's better than that one, you, how can I put this? You, you're almost basing your faith, 
your following of Jesus based upon that leader. Do you see the concept? So when that leader falls from grace, which may happen, I pray that it doesn't happen at all for me in any way, shape or form. But, you know, it has been known there are plenty of history and news for us where leaders have unfortunately fallen from grace within the eyes of their church. They have sinned and it's become highly public. And um, actually, that's, I know in the past years, in, in years gone past of hearing people whose faith has been destroyed in Jesus because they'd latched on to a leader, a human leader. You know, we human leaders are that, human. We are, you know, we are just as sinful as anybody else. We need just as much as God's grace as anybody else. So actually to latch on to a particular leader and say, oh, well, that one's better than that one, you can see Paul going, why? So Paul is saying, I planted the church. I, Paul, planted the church. Absolutely, which is true. He planted the church. And he's using, obviously, agricultural imagery here. And he said, but Apollos then came along and taught in it to bring you to maturity. That's what he's getting at when he says that, uh, you know, it's Apollos that came and watered it. He helped to bring it to maturity. Now, I'm no gardener. That will be testified by joy. I can destroy, that's not a problem. Give me a tree to hack, I'm your man. If you want a 12 footer brought down, I'm it, all right? I can, I can tear things apart in the garden, but how to make something grow and mature and whatever else, I can't do that. I don't plant and I do not keep things alive in the plant world. My plant in my office currently that was in full bloom and gorgeous is now a testament to my ability to kill plants. David looked at it, this pastor David looked at it this week and he looked at it briefly and he went, that's not looking very well, Warren. I said, I know. But apparently when you water plants, that's what helps them grow and become more and more mature, isn't it? Apparently. I... <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Uh, apparently, that's what happens. You're meant to water them, and they come to maturity, and they grow. Well, Paulus was the one who comes along and waters it by teaching biblically, giving pastoral care, and teaching the church how to grow. But, says Paul, no matter whether I come and planted it, and Paul does the wa- um, Apollos does the watering, it's God that makes it grow. He can come and do all the watering. And it might be the right thing. But unless you're open to the spirit, unless your ground is open to God working on you, then you ain't going to grow. So he said it's God that's more important in this case. Don't latch on to a human leader because it's God who is to help you grow. And also the reason he's using this imagery of farm labourers is quite funny because if you remember, Corinth latches on to their church leaders. They want these eloquent speakers, these marvellous leaders they can parade around the city. It's because that's what the city does. And they want to do that. And he says, right, well, guess what? We're no different from servants on a farm, which in the Corinthian society was the lowest form of labour. To be a farm labourer, you were looked down upon. So Paul goes, great, parade the leaders around, but we're no different from farm labourers. You're the farm, we, you're basically lifting up common labourers, mere humans. He's actually deliberately undermining their cultural values. And he's saying, actually, by you lifting up these common labourers, you're clearly stunting your own growth. Paul is also, in another way, sort of clearing the path for future leaders of the church in Corinth by putting himself and Apollos down as mere servants of the Lord and saying, actually, they are assigned by God now for the task now. I, I, Paul, came along and planted. That was my task at that moment, at that time. Apollos comes along and his job is to come and water you for now. And they talk about Cephas, Peter. And and we sort of forget the the bunch that only follow Jesus because they're actually causing more damage than, than necessary. And he's saying actually leaders for now are almost sort of dispensable. Don't be hanging on to a particular human leader. 
because it's actually God who's using them to do something. They're there for a period, for a time. So I planted, says Paul, Apollos pastorally led, which is right because God has assigned each of us a task. But it's God who will make the work we've done grow. In our workplaces, I bet sometimes we think we're almost indispensable. And then one day they come and make us redundant. Or you might be somebody, I know of a story of many years ago, somebody who was coming up for retirement, big head of a big department. And um, it, as he was leading up to retirement, uh, it was well known that he kept talking about the fact that he, he thought, I don't know how they're going to run this. He'd been doing it for years and years and years. He knew the department inside and out for years and years and years and years. I don't know how they're going to cope without me when I go. Uh, how they're going to run this, how they're going to do that. You know, well respected. That wasn't the problem. It wasn't that the person wasn't liked in the company. Well respected. They retired. Within about a month of retiring, they shut the entire department down. Because it was recognised it wasn't needed anymore. It had its time. It was time to move on. And so therefore then Paul is saying, so don't latch on to a human leader. Don't do that. The point, according to one uh, commentary I was reading, the point of Paul's analogy of the field is that the progress of the gospel is the work of God. When it comes to church growth, whereas ministers, denominations and institutions are, exist really because they are necessary for that time, that's fine, but it's only God that has absolute significance. And this is where the Corinthian church were not understanding. It's, it's what, what is God doing? Paul had gone, and yet they're sort of hanging on to this Paul who hasn't been in the church for four and a half years. And there's a whole bunch of them going, oh, Paul, Paul. And he's going, no, 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 no. I've done my time. I've done my time. Apollos is next. And then we'll see later on, he talks about sending Timothy. Again, Timothy to be a church leader. He's sort of saying, well, obviously, Timothy's going to come in and need to do some work. But if you're hanging on to me, or you're hanging on to Apollos, or you're hanging on to Cephas, or you lot who think you only just follow Jesus and hear Jesus' voice only, you're missing the point. God does things. Are you with me so far? I did say we're going to need to rush some of this, so I'm not going to hang on too much for too many things. But what I like about this is it, this simply is true. Dispensable as leaders are, dispensable all of us in any ministry might well be, our labour is not in vain if it is done for the Lord. The issue is we sometimes labour and labour and labour and actually we forget it's God that sends the rain. A farmer has to plough the field, amen? They have to apparently put the seed in the ground. They apparently have to help it to water and be irrigated and ready to go. But it's only God who sends the rain. Yeah, even if it comes out of a hose, the water eventually has come from God, from the rain, yes? It's the same thing. Unless God sends the rain on that workplace, it's not going to be of God. So, verse 9. You, church, are the field to which we leaders are to work in, according to Paul. But we are God's servant leaders. You are God's own possession as a church. Amen? That's who you are. So Paul carries on with this analogy from verse 10. You are God's building. Ready? Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal that kind of work each builder has done. Excuse me. The fire will show, its show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. 
But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Okay, this section of the passage, as a leader, I do not like. But it is one of those many ones that hopefully with me and all other leaders should keep us very much in check. Firstly, if the foundation of any building is not laid correctly, then the whole building cannot stand. Isn't that correct, those who are builders, workers, Frank? Yes? The foundation is poor, it will collapse. Just very quickly, if you've ever been in the church kitchen in what we call the newer part of the building, built in 1969, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it's got whopping great um, ledges as you walk in, which I can guarantee you from the church premise and management team are a real pain when you're trying to reconstruct a new kitchen in there, okay? But these whopping great broad ledges, and what they are, they're the foundations of the building. They are beyond what is normally required because when the bomb hit this hole and created the crater, these foundations at the back needed to be like that to hold the building up, yeah? And so far, since 1969, it's holding up fairly well, amen? And let's hope it continues. But that's because some put investment was put into the foundations of that building to make it stand for longer. And Paul is stating here, and not in an arrogant or obnoxious way, that because of God's grace and his reliance on it, he laid the Corinthian church foundation like an expert. And it's people like Apollos who are now, and other leaders that will come along, are building upon that foundation. Now, I'm not a builder, but what I do know is, I do watch enough of things like grand designs and and all that sort of stuff, that apparently you might get one set of people come in and do the foundational work. You then get maybe some bricklayers in who can build the bricks because they're trained to do that. You'll get another lot that come and do the floors and the rafters and the roofers will come in and the plumbers will come in and the electricians will come in and the plumbers will come in. All people skilled to do what they need to do. It's the same thing. Paul has said, I have laid a foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus that's done it. I've just been used by him to do it and I've done that. And it's others that will come along and build upon that foundation. We here at Greenford Baptist Church, we enjoy the fruits of the foundation of the ministry that got built here back in 1930s. Because they built a foundation based on Jesus Christ. We enjoy the fruits of that now. We stand on the shoulders of giants of faith. Colonel Browning, I hope I got that right. Major Browning, I always get that wrong. Major Browning, when he went to do the door-to-door, knocking, trying to get the church to gather into this area, he didn't build it upon Major Browning, he built it upon Jesus Christ. That's why it's still standing. And all those previous leaders that we are standing on the shoulders of and thanking them for and why we're here today did just as Jesus told them. They relied upon him. I'm sure there were times that some of their decisions were not favourable from within the church. I know they weren't. I've seen the minutes. But yet here we are. Because... They were being God's servant in what needed to happen. So, Paul's laid a foundation based on Jesus. And then in verse 12, Paul seems to list six materials to which following leaders could build with. Now, it's build with. Now, again, it's an analogy, all right? So, it's not that they're going to build with gold, silver, and jewels, i.e., oh, let's make that wall gold. That one's silver, and that one full of jewels. That'll look lovely, won't it? No, no. It's using an analogy, which we'll come to. 
But there's two categories they fall into. Gold, silver, and jewels is one. Wood, hay, and straw is another. And this sort of invokes imagery of Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, and verses 13 to 15, to which I'm just going to read to you. So if you want to, you can look at it. If you want to, it's Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. But remember I said to you, the Corinthian letter that Paul has written is giving them a bigger picture. It's giving them a picture from the Old Testament. He's trying to use imagery that will understand. So here we go. Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you took for so e- whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothing. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem, as he did in the past. At that time I will put you on trial. I am eager to witness against all sorcerers and adulterers and liars. I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages, who oppress widows and orphans, or who deprive the foreigners living among you of justice. For these people do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Excuse me. Then drop to 13 to 15. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use in serving our God? What have we gained by obeying his command or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed for those who do evil get rich and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. The day of judgment is that whole analogy there, the day of the Lord. Notice the fact that it's using gold and silver and God is seen as the one coming along to purify that gold and silver, to burn off the dross, yeah? And this is the same imagery that Paul is trying to show here by saying leaders need to build with gold, silver and jewels or they build with wood, hay and straw. And we'll see what he means by that. Just as a sideline, really quickly. When we read verse 5, did everybody like the fact that his Lord is eager to witness against all sorcerers? And we, we tend to drop down straight away and go to, uh, the Lord has a go at those who cheat employees of their wages or oppress widows and orphans who deprive foreigners living among you of justice. And we go, oh, the Lord should have a go at them. But we seem to miss the bit that sort of tends to say about adulterers and liars. It's become almost commonplace in our society to have affairs and to almost tell little white lies. But God clearly has a problem with that as well. I just, sideline, just thought I'd mention it in passing. I don't know why, it wasn't in my thinking to do that this morning. But as I read that, I felt I'd just say that. So it's on judgment day that a leader's work will be shown for its worth. Remember, he's talking to the church, but he's also very much clearly talking to leaders. If a leader's work is built out of gold, silver, or jewels, then when the purifying fire comes to burn off the rubbish, what is left is pure gold, pure silver, and glistening beautiful jewels. But if the leader has effectively built a ministry made of flammable substances like wood, hay, or straw, then poof, it'll all go up in smoke and be nothing. For any leader who cares about what God thinks, this is sobering stuff. Verse 14, Paul talks about reward. A reward that is coming for any leader who 
If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. We don't know what Paul meant by that. We know it's received on the day of judgment, but not what is meant by that. But if the leader has built with wood, hay or straw, that leader is still saved, still saved, but only by the skin of their teeth. Now, this is not a saved by works message. Let's be very clear about that. It's not a saved by works message. Paul is not contradicting himself when he says we are saved by faith, not by works. He's not contradicting himself. But what he is saying is that God cares so much, and this came from one of the commentaries. I'm going to quote it. God cares about his church, and he holds its leaders accountable for how they build it. Enjoying this sermon? Good. I thought you lot might. I ain't. Enjoying this sermon, leadership team? No, I didn't think so. Right. Christian leaders are only servants of God, says uh, Campier and Rosner, not the church, and should not be accorded any allegiance that is reserved for God alone. I.e., what was going on? They were just trying to lift up the leaders. Think they're wonderful and forgetting sort of God in the process. Do you know what I mean? They were giving wonderful praise to the leaders, which really should be going to God. Now, by the way, before we fall into this trap of thinking we don't have to encourage our leaders, that's not what they're saying. They're over-worshipping their leaders, uh, which is wrong. Very, very wrong. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the jewels and the gold in a moment, but not just yet. So verse 16 to 17. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. At that point... Hopefully you've noticed that Paul has now moved to the wider church community, briefly. He's only done it for these two verses. This is not just to the leaders. There is a massive status change here, just briefly. You are God's temple. Do you understand what it means by God's temple? It's where heaven touches earth. He's using the temple imagery of where God, as far as the Jews were concerned, that is where God rests. Heaven touches earth. So guess what, my brothers and sisters? We, as church, are where God touches earth. Isn't that good? Doesn't that make you feel wonderful inside? And actually, that means both for single and plural, because there's the if anyone, And we'll come to that in a moment. But that means each and every one of us is where heaven touches earth. Wherever you are today, heaven touches earth. You know that prayer, uh, the Lord's Prayer? What's that prayer, that bit? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're praying that prayer because you are where heaven touches earth. So the will of God is only done through you. That's scary for a minute. Because wherever you walk, wherever you tread, heaven is touching earth. Whoever you talk to, heaven is touching them. You are the temple of God. Amen? Amen. It's not just about Sunday mornings. It's about out there. And even in here on a Sunday morning, we are where heaven touches earth. When you look at each person, you go, do you know something? Follower of Jesus Christ, you're where heaven touches earth. Jeez me up. Should make me look forward into my day ahead. I'm where heaven touches earth. We collectively of a body is where heaven touches earth. It should make you view all circumstances, all situations and all people you ever come across in the light of where you are heaven, where heaven touches earth. You are the temple of God. Amen? Should be g'd up about that. A lot more excited. I wanted us to sit here and really reflect on what that meant. Because when Paul talks about you are holy, you are sanctified, you are where heaven touches earth. But where Paul is talking about this as well, he says, the spirit of God lives in you. And we go, yes. But 
God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. The church in Corinth is destroying God's temple by their splitting, their factioning. By you follow this leader, follow this leader. They're splitting the church. They're destroying the church's work. When there's infighting, there's no outward fighting. There's no going out there and doing things for the kingdom of God because you're all too busy battling on the internal stuff that's going on. Yes? And so he's saying anybody who is doing this at this time is destroying God's temple and God will destroy them. Nice, healthy, makes you feel cheerful right now. As I said, he's not talking to the leaders. He's talking to everyone, leaders included. So we have to be cautious. So what is he saying? Well, he's talking about where's your heart motives to them? They've taken too much of society's cultural views into the church They're not even realising what they're doing. So he continues. Verses 18 to 23. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader, for everything belongs to you. Whether Paul, sorry, whether Peter, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter, or the world or life and death, or the present and the future, everything belongs to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. You belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. This is Paul's first real time of actually truly having a go and actually telling off the church. Stop deceiving yourselves. You think you're wise by the world standard. Your lifting up of one leader over another is proof that you are not, he's saying. The world does that. That's the world values, and you're missing the point. Said, the wisdom of the world is foolish to God. If the powers of this world knew that by killing Christ, they were going to lose the war, they wouldn't have put Christ on the spot. They wouldn't have stuck him on the cross. They thought by killing him, they were going to win. The wisdom of this world is kill or be killed, is it not? Stamp on somebody else, I'll win. Paul is saying, no, you are deceiving yourselves. You've really got this wrong. Because he's saying, why would you want to follow one leader over another? Everything belongs to you. Saying all the leaders belong to the church. You are the temple of God and the leader's role is to build the church. It is set a task set by God for that leader. Not a task set by the church in how they want to be built. Therefore, a church has no possession over the leader because everybody is possessed by God. God has the possession. Do you understand the point? Don't bother chasing after one leader or another, Paul is saying, because actually they've all been set a task by God and they're owned by God as you are owned by God. So don't be hanging on to some other leader like Paul because that time has long gone. And Paul, a bit later on, talks about how actually he's their spiritual father. A leader's role, from the analogies of the field and the building, is to build the church that God wants. Do you agree with that? Oh, that was a little bit. Let's rephrase that. The role of a leader, or leaders, is to help build the 
church that God wants, according to Paul. Yeah? It's the church that God wants, not always necessarily the church that the church wants. It's very key. If the foundation is Jesus Christ, then it's got to be Jesus' church. Amen? So therefore then, there might be times, and I have been one of these people back in the late 90s, I want to be the way I want to be. But after a few wonderful times with uh, various leaders who, who've correctly and correctly guided me, and I'll use the phrase guided in a good way, I haven't ploughed through me. I, Warren, am more in following of Christ than I was before. But sometimes that means, unfortunately, there are things that are said by leaders to us that we may not like. Or changes of direction. By the way, this is not some prophetic thing that I'm talking about in the future. I have no idea. This is just, I'm telling you what I see here in this passage. But it's, if the leaders are to build the God church that God wants, but we're going to do things we're not going to like. You know, when you want to build a, new, build a house or extend your house slightly, you normally have to knock down an odd wall every now and again, don't you? To get it bigger. Yeah? Actually, just realised, this is an analogy of that sort of concept, what, the work we've done here. Sometimes you have to knock down a few walls, and that is not very nice sometimes. That creates dust and dirt. And sometimes you're clearing up that dust for months afterwards. Yes? Who's ever had building work done? You know what it's like, yeah? Yeah, it's had long extended we'll have that another time I'm still mopping up the dust in my office from the building work was done here because it takes time to clear some of it up and 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 settle it down before people start seeing oh, this is what God wants may not like it but this is what God wants but as long as that leader is building the church that God wants The problem here was that the Corinthian church were too busy following the charismatic leaders or what they thought were the charismatic leaders rather than what God wanted. It's like elections. Oh, they're coming up, aren't they? What do political parties do? What's the most thing in the papers? Was that leader of that party charismatic enough? I don't care. It's the policies of the party I'm more interested in. What's the foundation that they want? And it's that same thing. Church leaders, what is the foundation that they want? Is it God's foundation? If it is, great. I want to follow that person. I want to follow what God is saying through them. I don't care if they're charismatic or not. It's the same thing. So, chapter 4. One. It's okay. We haven't got long. Don't worry. I'm going to be plowing through these next 17 verses. So look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now a person who is put in charge as a faithful manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. Paul is summing up this section on leaders, which, as I said, is about himself as well. Now, it's what I like about the NLT. They've actually put the appropriate meaning about what it means to be servants. If I quickly can go back, if it's possible. He's quite right in saying church leaders are servants. We've no bones about that at all. But he says, so look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ. Eyes, don't hold leaders up, please. Don't hold us up. Into, into a pedestal. We are mere servants of Christ, but we've been put in charge by God to explain God's mysteries, apparently. Now, a person who is put in charge as a faithful, as a manager must be charged. The word here that Paul is using as servant is more like an estate manager. 
It reflects for us a Genesis chapters. In Genesis, where God turns around to Adam and Eve and says, you have dominion over the land. They're being basic. You've come to manage the land. Manage it. Under my authority, you're answerable to me, but manage the land. Problem is Adam and Eve screwed that up. And this is what he's saying. Leaders have been put in charge like estate managers to explain God's mysteries. And the manager must be faithful to God because it's God that's going to judge ahead of time. When Paul talks about himself that he doesn't judge himself, he's not being arrogant. As the commentary states, the faithful leader of God can be trusted to present the gospel appropriately, not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And as chapter 4, verses 8 to 13 says, goes on to demonstrate, not as a shining success, but as scum of the earth, a status in keeping with the crucified Messiah. And we're going to look at what is meant by that in a moment. Paul's saying that he shouldn't be judged by human eyes, worldly standards, which is what the Corinthian church were doing. They were judging their leaders by the fancy teachers on the outside, saying, I'm not judged by that. God will judge the worth of any leader's heart and their work in the right time. How does our world judge things? It's all about now. Instant results, isn't it? Who works in the workplace where there's meetings and they suddenly want things to happen now? Somebody's been put in charge of a company. You see, it sometimes I've been put in part, charge of big companies, um, like, uh, I don't know, department stores or something. And the department store's been going downwards for ages, even before they arrived. Yet they've arrived, and within three months, the results have come out. And then there's this, uh, everybody's having a go at them. Having a go at that leader. Well, what have you done wrong? And he's saying, I've only been in the role for three months. I've not really been able to stamp my mark yet. It's that sort of imagery. Our world today expects instant results, don't we? You want to buy something? Ah, bung it on the credit card. You've got a problem, you expect it to be resolved today. You pray about it with God and you wonder why God's not answered you within three seconds. Uh, we laugh, but it's true. I'm not getting what I want, and God doesn't work that way. Therefore, in assessing any leader's work, Paul is unpacking, including the leader self-assessing themselves, it has to be done with God's eyes. The Corinthians were judging by their cultural eyes, by the results that they could see with their eyeballs, their cultural desires, do you see with me? They weren't using God's eyes. That's why Paul says, I'm not judging myself. I can't. I've got to allow God to judge me. If I keep judging by what I see by my eyes, I'm going to turn myself up into knots because it doesn't look like I'm doing a very good job. That could be his view, especially when he's talking to, at the time, four years on, a church that he planted was still immature. If at any point he could have thought, hang on a minute, I've really screwed this up. I've messed up. I've not done what God wanted because of what I see with my human eyes. He, he's missed, you know, he could really get himself tied up into little knots. And he didn't want to do that. So this is what he's saying. He's not saying, I am so perfect, I don't need anybody to say anything. He's saying, I leave God to judge me. Which sometimes for leaders does require those who they can trust, other leaders they can trust, who will come up to them and say, do you know something, you're out of order. You need a bit of a slap down as a leader. You think you've got it sorted. You think you're doing what God wants you to do. He hasn't. I have people like that in my life who, believe you me, pull me up no end if I'm out of order. And that's right and proper. And I'm sure Paul did as well. Verses 6 to 12. Dear brothers and sisters, 
No, hang on. I'm missing the... No, that is correct, isn't it? Yes. Dear brothers and sisters, I've used Apollos and myself to illustrate what I've been saying. It was obviously used them because he's heard what the church is doing, bouncing them off one against the, each other. If you pay attention to what I've quoted from the scriptures, you won't be proud of one of your leaders at the expense of another. What gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? You think you already have everything you need. You think you are already rich. You have begun to reign in God's kingdom without us. I wish you really were reigning already, for then we would be reigning with you. Instead, I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display, like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. We have become a spectacle, spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools, but you claim to be so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honoured, but we are ridiculed. Even now we go hungry and thirsty and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and have no home. We work re wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up to the present moment. Paul is having a go at the Corinthians' pride. As uh, Semper puts it, the Corinthians viewed themselves as being fully supplied, rich, and even reigning in the kingdom of God, in contrast to Paul, especially in terms of their wisdom and gifts. Paul counters that wisdom of the cross and the spirit, indicates that this inflated view of themselves is sadly mistaken. I wish I had time to fully unpack 9 to 13, but it's sarcasm at its best. Who's ever said to me, sarcasm is the lowest form of wit? Oh man, Paul used it. Great. The Corinthians think they know better than anybody else. They actually almost think they know better than the leaders. That's clearly evident by saying, oh, I want to follow this one. Oh no, I want to follow this one. And those ones who say, I only want to follow Jesus. Anyway, I only listen to Jesus. Paul is saying, you think you know better. You think you're reigning already in the kingdom of God. You think you've got it perfect. I so wish you had, because we would be there with you. No, you haven't. You've got it right and royally wrong. It's all about image, and that's wrong. Verse 12, when it says we work rearily with our own hands to earn our living, in today's society, we tend to go, oh, that's a good thing. But actually, it's a bit of hyperbole that Paul's using, because in their time, that was seen as actually the wrong thing to do. In the Corinthians' eyes, to be working with your hands like a labourer, oh, oh, no, eloquent speakers don't do that. They just use their voices. And they earn their living that way. Paul is saying, no, but I use my hands. I'm get down and dirty and I get on with it and the Corinthians would be <gasps> bulking at that idea do you see what I mean and at the end when he talks about that we bless those who curse us we are patient with those who abuse us we appeal gently when evil things are said about us yet we are treated at the world's garbage like everybody's trash right up to the present moment, saying you hold up your leaders as if they should be on a pedestal. But actually, a true leader of Christ will follow the crucified Messiah. Most good leaders of Christ are actually abused, shouted at, whatever phrase you want to use. They're treated like the world's garbage. That is part of the role of being a leader. And part of the role of a leader sometimes is to Stand there and just allow it to happen. Doesn't give excuse 
for people to, and he's talking, by the way, to the inside of the church. He's not talking to the outside, by the way. I just, sorry, I forgot to mention that. He's still talking to the members of the church at Corinth. He's not talking to the outside. It doesn't leave any excuse for people to get away with abusing leaders and having a go at them. But it is a God-given job. Sometimes leaders have to take it, but doesn't necessarily mean that they like it. But that's what leaders are. When he uses that imagery of the, like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, that's what used to happen. The leaders of the army would be paraded through the streets in chains, naked and abused, saying, aha, we've got them. We've got to shame that leader of that army. Effectively, leaders are seen as Paul's description here, leaders of the army. And I would actually like to say, I think as a church, we should be more like an army. And if you want to understand what I mean by that, see me afterwards. We, church, should be more of warriors. So, we'll finish. I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. That's why I send Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. There Paul explains why he's describing how they should view leaders and why they've got it slight wrong. It's just not admonishment and sarcasm. It's to warn you, you're self-deceived. You've misunderstood the role of a Christian leader. And I, as a loving father, says Paul, I'm correcting you, disciplining you. And I'm sending another church leader to you, Timothy. Hopefully you'll listen to him. He'll remind you of what I'm like and how I'm faithfully following Jesus Christ. And notice Paul is saying, I teach this at all the churches. This is not something I don't teach elsewhere, i.e. I am straight down the middle. I know we've run slightly over time, but I just want to say this. I'll be up front, and please, I do hope you hear me. I want us... I want me, I want leadership team to be a church that builds a church that Christ wants that's made out of gold, silver and jewels. You with me? That at the day of judgment, when the dross is burnt off, that there will be shining gold, shining silver and shining jewels. The Spirit of God will be known as a presence in this church more and more than it is even now. We will be known as a church that out there in the community knows we're a place where heaven touches earth. Amen? Amen? Amen. Do you want to be known as that or not? Not for your glory, but for his glory. I hope at the day of judgment when I get there that I will get... It won't be wood, hay and straw. It will be a church that God has built. I know we as a leadership team believe that very much, that this will be known as a church that God has built. Amen? Amen. So that's going to take all of us together. Amen? amen. Oh, that's less of an amen. It will take all of us together. Amen? amen. Let's pray. Just take a few moments. Allow the Spirit to work in you. Father, I want to give you thanks for all leaders of all churches. I want to thank you for those churches who heard your voice, voted them in. Those churches who are willing to allow their leaders to go and to do other work that you've assigned. Lord, because those are churches who are faithful to their God. I want to pray here for us at Greenford Baptist Church, Lord Heavenly Father, each of us, each of us will build your kingdom so it shines like gold, shines like silver, 
sparkles like jewels, but is built on the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to listen to you, Lord, at all times and do what you are doing. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.